Joining us today in the studio to discuss education, Minister Naftali Bennett's push for a new code of ethics for Israeli universities is Eitan Meir. Eitan is a director of development and external relations at Imtirtu, an Israeli organization that works to fight BDS in Israel and has been cited as a strong motivator in crafting the new code of ethics. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, so let's start with Im Tirtu and its role in drafting this code. What role did it exactly play in drafting the code? So we're very proud to say that Im Tirtu played a major role in drafting this. For years, this has really been a focal point of our activity, is really promoting and exposing all the stuff that's go that goes on in Israeli academia. So why don't you kind of give us a, a quick um, summary of what the code entails? Sure, the, the code basically wants to, wants to separate political activity and academia, and rightfully so. It says that political that any political expressions that the professors make should be in the confines of the class. There shouldn't just be random remarks that, you know, the IDF, they kill children, they do this, blah, blah, blah which has happened, and we've seen it happen over and over again. It says that political program, academic programs, that as, for example, now in Hebrew U, there's actually an academic program that gives you a scholarship, it gives students scholarship and academic credits for volunteering in organizations like B'Tselem, like Hamoked, which is an NGO that defends now, terrorists. Now, why, why, I mean, why do you believe that this code of ethics is needed? Again, we've, in addition to all the reports that we published over the years, stuff really, uh, professors promoting BDS, legal clinics in Haifa that are actually defended terrorists who murdered Israelis in court. We've received hundreds and hundreds of complaints over the years from students who've basically told us, listen, we're sitting in the class, we're getting one view of the conversation, we're scared. We know that if we talk out, the professor is going to yell at us. We know that he's going to give us a bad grade. When we're writing papers, when we wrote about a Zionist subject, we were given remarks off, and this has happened, and we know this has happened. People ask us, what is the need for this? Well, I, I mean, I remember when I was in college, I dealt with mm -hmm. that. I sometimes had professors who didn't necessarily preach points of views that I agreed with personally. But mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't you say, in a, in a sense, this is a type of academic censorship of sorts? Because at the same time, you do want to be exposed to a range of ideas, whether or not you agree with them. Exactly. And that's what the code actually promotes. It says that a professor has the obligation to give both sides of the story. For example, I professors, to this day, I don't even know if they were left wing or right wing. Why? There was a controversial subject, and they said, OK, I'm, pro I'm providing this point of view and that point of view. And they said it. They didn't give the personal opinion. There was a really a vibrant academic debate, and it was great. There was no need for them to you know, throw in their own remarks about, oh, by the way, you know, I think the IDF kills children, and I think that Israel's an apartheid state. People ask, why, why do we need this? And it's really simple. When you have professors, let's say, in Ben Gurion University, who, for his mandatory class of 200 people, invites activists of breaking the silence, tells the students they have to come to class, it's mandatory. They can't film it, they can't ask questions, they don't bring anyone from the other side, that's politicization. When you have professors that promote the BDS movement and they say that in their classes, that's politicization. When you have, again, like I said, academic programs that allow you to volunteer in radical organizations, that's politicization. Even last year in Ben Gurion University, ben -Gurion University the Department for Middle Eastern Studies, they unanimously voted to present a prize to breaking the silence of 20,000 check, a human rights prize. Now, you ask yourself, this is supposed to be a department, it's supposed to be a place of pluralism, of a place of, that you could express different opinions. How is it possible that a whole entire department of over 20 professors provided, gave a prize to the most controversial organization in Israel? Now, you know, the Committee of University Heads and the National Union of Israeli Students have come out against this new ethics code. Why is that? Honestly, I can't speak for them. All I know is it's very unfortunate because if they actually read the code, and you've heard a lot of talk shows in Israel and people saying, I didn't actually read the code, but blah, blah, blah. And if we'd actually read the code, you'd understand that this is for the students. It's not for the professor. The professors They'd are from the point of strength. It'd also be the only Western country with this type of code of ethics, though, right? I mean, that... No, in, in America, there's also a code of ethics that's very okay. similar to this. And, and again, universities are... In but isn't that voluntarily? I mean, that's... What... And, and in, in 14, 2010, the Council for Higher Education in Israel, they came out with a decision that political activity in the university should be discouraged. And it was supposed to be the universities that were supposed to be the ones to enforce it. Seven years later, that hasn't happened. Ben Gurion University, for example, I keep on repeating Ben Gurion University because unfortunately there has been a lot of circumstances there. They have an academic, they have a code as like this. But the professor that drafted it, Yanai Navo, he said on his, in the Facebook post two months ago that he's pro-BDS. Now, I, why not just use the existing code of ethics that's been adopted by Ben Gurion University, which prohibits lecturers from endorsing political parties. Because it, it doesn't work. Ben Gurion University is the perfect example of a place that, it, that as a, a, the social sciences, the departments usually, that is just rampant anti-Zionism. You have professors there that are just not allowing students to express their opinions, and they're not expressing both points of the conversation. That's what we want. We want for pluralism. We want for the professors to get there and say, listen, there's two points of every story. Here's point A, here's point B, discuss. And there's no reason that that is any sort of censorship, censorship it, there's no reason that it stifles free speech. It's the opposite. It allows for students to actually speak and speak their mind, and it allows for academic growth. So I, I have one last question kind of to 
my only question so far anyway, to, to kind of follow that is how, how do you then prove that and then how, what are the steps that follow that? So that's actually something that's in the report that's not so clear. There is supposed to be a mechanism that's going to enforce it, and it's supposed to be the universities that are supposed to enforce it themselves. As of now, it's not clear that if a student complains and this university is supposed to look into it, it's not actually clear what's going to happen after that. Mm. And we're, we're, we're really supporting you know, Naftali Bennett, the Minister Bennett, as well as Professor Asa Kasher, who is the author of the IDF Code of Conduct, and he drafted this. Asa Kasher is not a right-wing guy. He is not a right wing guy at all. He's a left wing guy, and the fact that people are attacking him just shows the fact that they're so entrenched in their own views they can't even be open to understand there is a problem in academia. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but Thanks it was interesting to, to learn about this new ethic, of co this code of ethic. There we mm -hmm. go. All right, thank you. Thank you.